very excited to introduce our next guest, Dr. Fry. He has been in the community for more years than I can count, has helped thousands of families, and we are just so honored and privileged to have you here today. Thank you so much, Dr. Fry. Sure, thank you for inviting me. So um, obviously, you know, I know your background, but those that are watching, please tell us, what's, what is your background and why are you so passionate to help children? Right, well, th uh, thanks. Um, yeah, thanks for inviting me. Thanks for the introduction. Um, so my background um, is in uh, child neurology. Um, I did a uh, residency in both pediatrics and uh, neurology. And uh, I got very interested in um, kiddos that had developmental delays and um, learning disabilities. And I actually, after my residency, did a uh, fellowship in learning disabilities. Uh, but what happened is uh, when I went to the clinic, families would bring their children with autism because autism was just being more recognized at that time. This is kind of the um, early 2000s. It's really was, there was more awareness. And um, families would bring their kids with autism and say, um, Doc, um, the, uh, uh, my child's just been diagnosed with autism and they, they say they don't know what causes it. And they say they don't know what to do about it except some behavioral therapy. And I, I think there's something else. Um, and uh, you're a neurologist, they think it probably has something to do with the brain, so maybe you could, you know, help me figure out uh, what, uh, what is wrong with my child and what I can uh, do about it. Um, and at that time, I was um, um, doing more pure neurology, and we knew that there are certain types of seizures that uh, can cause um, symptoms and worsen symptoms of autism, so I knew how to do an EEG and interpret that, so that's something I could do, and I started there. And then um, I started to find out there was other things associated with autism, like uh, mitochondrial disorders. I, I found that there was a child with a mitochondrial disorder in autism, they knew how to test for that. Um, and then um, as the years went by, I found that there was these other disorders associated with autism, and I figured out how to test for them. Um, and so um, suddenly I was able to test for many different underlying conditions that were treatable for kiddos with autism. At the same time, my colleagues still didn't know what to do with the kids with autism that were referred to them. So they said, hey, why don't you take all the kids in my clinic with autism? And before I knew it, I had an unofficial autism clinic because those were the only patients that I was seeing. Um, and uh, so that's, uh, that um, has uh, been somewhat successful because we found some really effective treatments for children. So um, it's, been, um, it's been good and I think it's helped a lot of families. Well, and I know that, you know, you've done so many studies. I know your, your research, you're, you're doing even more research now. But one of the things you've um, come across is folate receptors. Can you talk a little bit about that in your research? Sure. Um, yeah, most definitely. So um, it's a really um, interesting area, and it's been very fruitful in being able to treat uh, some kids. Some kids really respond to this special type of folate called glucoborin calcium. Um, and we're doing the studies to try and figure out who those kids are and what doses to give the, the medication in. Um, but I'll tell you a little bit about the background of it. So, um, you know, there was a uh, disorder called cerebral folate deficiency that was described in about 2001 or so by a, a doctor uh, named Dr. Rainmakers in Belgium. And um, um, he noticed that he saw the kiddos that had neurodevelopment neurodevelopmental regression, they lost skills very early on in life, in about, about one year of age. And he would do something called a, a lumbar puncture um, to look at the spinal fluid, the fluid that surrounds the brain and spinal cord. And he measured a number of things, but one thing he noticed is that the uh, folate level was low in their brain. And folate's a very important vitamin, vitamin B9. Um, it's, uh, we know that of it because it's fortified in all our foods, it's so important. Um, and the uh, cells um, in our body don't work if they don't have folate because folate's involved in so many of the uh, metabolic pathways um, of our cells. So um, he uh, first saw these uh, children and at first he thought it was a genetic condition. And so he looked for uh, the gene that uh, codes for the transporter that transports folate from uh, the blood into the brain. Everything that gets into the brain is very highly controlled. It's a privileged place of our body. So we have to have special machinery to shuttle things in and out. 
Um, and, um, you know, he thought that what was happening is this folate transport system wasn't working and maybe it was a genetic condition, but he didn't find any genetic abnormalities in the, the genes that uh, are responsible for the folate um, transport system. So then he teamed up with a uh, doctor by the name of Dr. Quatros at SUNY Downstate. And, and Dr. Quatros found that there's, there were these antibodies running around um, the blood of these kids um, that would bind onto the folate uh, machinery and uh, cause it not to work. He found there was actually two antibodies. There was a, a blocking antibody that would block folate from actually binding onto the machinery, and then there was a, um, a binding antibody which would bind onto the machinery and, and stop it from working all that well. Um, and they found out that that seemed to be the, uh, the cause. Of course, we have all types of antibodies in our blood normally. Normally, they're there to, uh, to uh, bind to viruses and bacteria to protect us, but sometimes they can bind onto um, parts of our body that are good and uh, cause them not to work. So the particular piece of machinery that uh, transports folate into the brain is called the folate receptor alpha. Um, so they, they reasoned that uh, this was not working, um, but it ends up our uh, body has a backup system. It's called the reduced folate carrier, which carries folate into the brain. It doesn't work as well um, as the folate receptor alpha, um, and you need to use special types of folate to get through it, and you have to give them at high doses. So uh, they found that they, uh, they could give high doses of a special type of folate called leucovorin calcium, um, and it improved um, the function of many of these children. Some of them, all their symptoms resolved. Um, when they started publishing, they, uh, they mentioned that some of the kids had autism. In fact, a lot of the kids had autism, but they, they noted it as kind of a secondary um, thing. Um, but myself and Dr. Rosignol back in 2010 said, huh, how many of the kids that come to our clinic may have these antibodies? So what we did is uh, we um, offered the test in our clinic and we found out that um, out of 93 children that we initially tested, that 75% of them had this uh, antibody, one of the two antibodies, the blocking or the binding antibody, or both, uh, to stop folate from getting into their brain. And then we said, well, um, if they have the antibody, uh, we could do a lumbar puncture, which some um, uh, families uh, chose to do to measure the level, or we could try uh, leucovorin calcium, the special type of folate, because it's very safe, um, to see if it works. And uh, what we found is that in the kiddos that had the antibody, that uh, treating with leucovorin calcium um, resulted in improvements, particularly in language. Um, and so there was um, some abrupt changes, and abrupt positive changes in language. Um, and then uh, we did our second study that was just uh, published officially last year, um, which was a double-blind placebo-controlled trial, where the doctors, neither the doctors nor the patients, know if they're getting a placebo or sugar pill or the uh, active ingredient, which was leucovorin calcium. And we showed that in that, uh, in that type of methodology, which is highly controlled, um, that also the ones, the kiddos that um, got the placebo didn't see much change, but the ones that got leucovorin calcium, um, they had really an abrupt improvement um, in language. Um, it's not every uh, child, um, but, um, but there was a substantial number and it, it had uh, quite a uh, strong what we call effect size. Um, and we found that the folate receptor antibody uh, predicted who was going to respond and who wasn't. And in fact, um, those that um, had the folate receptor antibody, uh, we found that about 60% um, about of them or so uh, would respond um, really abruptly in a positive manner um, with increased language. Um, so we think it's a very promising treatment for a subset of kiddos with autism. And so for those that um, don't know, how do you find a doctor that even knows how to test for that? I mean, I'm thinking a lot of families out there are watching going, I went to my pediatrician and I don't think they have any clue what you're talking about. How do they find a doctor that understands what you just said? Yeah, I mean, I think that um, more and more people are becoming aware of it. Um, you know, there um, uh, there's a commercial test for it now, whereas back when we started, it was just a research test. And so I think you have to find the physician that understands it. There's a lot of neurologists that, that understand it, um, but it's important to find a doctor that, that will work with you and um, understands 
um, how to test and, and how to uh, treat this disorder. If they don't want to do a lumbar puncture, is there other ways to test to get an accurate idea? Well, the um, you know we reasoned in our first study that uh, that since uh, lupavorin is safe, there's no harm in uh, a trial of lupavorin um, if um, if somebody has a folate receptor alpha autoantibody. Um, so now we do not routinely do lumbar punctures anymore, but we if if there's a positive uh, test, then we do a trial um, for a number of months to see if there is improvement um, on the medication. Um, so we do know that the, the titer um, of the antibodies correlates with uh, how depressed the levels are in the uh, cerebral spinal fluid. Um, and since lupavorin is safe, and we showed that in our, our recent double-blind placebo control study, that it didn't really have any uh, significant side effects. We think that a trial of it without a lumbar puncture um, is uh, is okay. What about is there any symptoms to uh, to look for if you are deficient? Um, if you do have a deficiency. So the the uh, kiddos that uh, that um, uh, that seem to respond, and the one thing that seems to respond is language. So those with language impairment, I think, are prime candidates for this type of testing. Um, and that's a lot, that's language impairment across um, the uh, the age group. That is, we found that um, older children who had some language or even spoken sentences, if they uh, were treated with lupavorin, their uh, language abilities um, would uh, improve um, and, and normalize. And then, for those that want to follow your work and, and find out more about what you're doing, do you have a website or anything you'd like to share? I do. Yeah, it's dr as in Dr. Richard E. Fry.com, so all one word. So go there, I try and post all the papers that we publish, so you can take a look and, uh, and let me know if you have any questions. Wonderful, and for those families that are maybe just getting the diagnosis for the first time and they're feeling a little bit lost and hopeless, um, what encouragement or any um, advice can you give them? Well, I think that there's um, hope out there. We're learning things every single day and we're getting that information out to medical professionals so they understand that uh, that autism is a treatable condition and we can make a lot of positive progress in many kiddos. Well gosh, Dr. Fry, thank you for all of your work. I'm always in awe of you. Um, thank you so much for everything you've done for our community and are doing for our community. Thank you.